right. We're live on the Junior Smalpy channel. It's going to be a fun story, bedtime story for all of you tonight. It's going to involve a lot of treasure, some silver, and uh, some combat even. I'll tell you how we got here. Once everyone gathers into the chat, and when the audience is here, we will start the story. But until then, we've got to wait for the notifications to go out. Until then, I'll be running silent, running deep, like a U-boat. Call of the Wild, welcome. Welcome to the chat, glad you're here. Carlos Danger. Buckle up for a good night story. This is going to be a fun one. This is going to be a good story. We all like sunken treasure stories. I even like submarine movies. So tonight's live is going to probably take us in a few directions. I'm going to come up with a really good movie recommendation as we go through this. And uh, it's important that you watch the movies I recommend because they're usually good ones. And uh, this is going to be a fun story. There's a couple of new moderators we're going to see tonight in the chat. And uh, we've got Trevor, Carlos. Excellent. Well, welcome, friends. Let's get right into it. I'll tell you how I got here first, and then we'll go through and we'll read the story. This is going to be the story of the SS John Barry. And we're no longer being sonar pinged. There we go. I thought that'd be fun to... Bring the video in with eight hours of sonar pings. Video doesn't appear for me. Oh, you got to reset it. I you figure it out. I uh, let's get first. Okay, so I was doing some reading, like I do, reading some different history, and I've always been fascinated with shipwrecks. Any shipwreck where they find a ton of treasure. I don't know of any little boy or, I guess, any person who doesn't like treasure stories, sunken treasure stories, and not all sunken treasure comes from the age of the pirates. As you know, there was plenty of ships that carried bullion oh, for decades, uh, even centuries after that, uh, across the seas. And one of the risks of that is anything from hurricanes to war, uh, things that cause ships to go down. We've talked about in the past the Gersopa, which was a large ship carrying silver in the Atlantic between the United States and England that went down again victim of a German U-boat. So recently I was doing some reading and I came across the name, uh, the SS John Barry, as a large, a large hoard of silver that had been found from a sunken ship. And I thought, well, you know, obviously with the SS there, I knew this was a, a US ship, probably more modern. And I kind of assumed it would be involved with World War II and I was right. Uh, but I dug into it, and I was like, well, first, of course, the first thing I did is, well, what was sunk? What, what what treasures are they talking about? And I began to search around, and the first thing I came across was these. These are actually on eBay, and these are, you know, in a slip, official silver rounds. We'll go into further details on these later, but these are from the SS John Barry, these reals, if you, if you look at them. They are silver reals, and, and they're about, from what I've read, the size of, I think, a half dollar. They went down in 1944. They were brought up in 1994. It looks like 2,600 meters below sea. And uh, just a, it looks like some Arabic writing, some crossed swords. It looks like some palms or date trees on the coin as well. And uh, this seller here has, looks like quite a few of them. They've sold 173. They've got more than 50% sold. But again, original packaging with a certificate of authenticity. Uh, so it looks pretty legit. They're in this real coin and uh, they're from Saudi Arabia. So, well, what's the story behind these coins? Why were there Arabian silver coins in a U.S. ship sunk in World War II? Well, of course, the first thing I did is I landed on Wikipedia. But I'm not going to start there with you. I'll just show you. This is the link to it. 
First, I want to go to this one here because this is the really interesting page that I opened up with. And this is a site called uboat.net and it catalogs apparently a lot of the history surrounding U-boats. And uh, this one here is the link to the situation involving the John Barry. American Steam Merchant, so let's go over the ship real quick. It was called the John Barry Steam Merchant Liberty Tonnage, 7,176 tons. I've always been curious. Uh, I guess that has something to do with displacement. Uh, why that's always included in the specs on a ship when you're reading about them, because I don't really know exactly what it means. I mean, it sounds, it's a lot of weight. I don't know if it's what the ship weighs or if that's the displacement of water. It's, um, I'm just not that seaworthy when it comes to my knowledge of that kind of stuff. Completed 1942. So the ship wasn't that old because it went down in 44. So it's a brand new boat, Oregon Shipbuilding from Portland, Oregon. Okay, so it's from the West Coast of the United States. It was owned by Likes Brothers SS Company from New Orleans, Louisiana. Home port was Portland. The date of the attack, 28th of August, 1944. This is a cool little history story already. 1944, it's World War II. You've got a U.S. steamship that's only two years old. It's out there. And it was sunk by U-859 by Johann Jebsen. Nice, stout German name. Brilliant U-boat captain, uh, I'm sure. The position was 15 degrees and 10 minutes north, 55 degrees, 18 minutes east. Grid MQ-1891. There was 68, it sounds like, on the ship. And of that, two died. And 66 of them survived. That's a pretty good survival rate for getting hit by torpedoes and sunk. Route was, they were going from Philadelphia, Aden, on the 26th of August to Raz Atanura in the Persian Gulf. Cargo, 8,200 tons of general cargo. General cargo, who knows what else that, what that might have been. And there was, this is the big part here, 2,000 tons of silver. 2,000 tons of silver are on this ship, okay? At the time, it's heading over there. And again, it was completed in February of 42. Here's the brief notes on the event. At 2200 hours on the 28th of August, 1944, the unescorted John Barry, Master Joseph Ellerwald, was torpedoed by U-859 about 125 miles off the coast of Saudi Arabia while steaming a zigzag course at 12 knots. One torpedo struck on the starboard side between the number two and number three hatches and flooded the forward portion of the ship. The explosion tossed one lifeboat into the after deck and blew another overboard. So the 10 officers, 31 crewmen, and 27 armed guards, the ship was armed with one 4-inch and one 3-inch and eight 20-millimeter guns. They abandoned ship and, in two, and the other two lifeboats and launched three of four rafts. One boat capsized while being launched, and spilled the occupants into the water, drowning the chief officer and one crewman. Some survivors righted and bailed out the capsized lifeboat the next morning. At 22.30 hours, the U-boat fired a coup de, grace, coup de grace, which hit the engine room, causing the vessel to break in two and sink. Two hours after the sinking, 31 survivors on two rafts and one lifeboat were picked up by the Dutch steam tanker Sonetta and landed at Aden on the 2nd of September. The remaining 35 survivors were rescued after 14 hours by the American steam merchant Benjamin Bourne. I'm surprised it wasn't the SS Jason Bourne. Well, they should have that ship. And uh, let's see, D-Dub's answering, dead weight tons is the weight the ship can carry. Okay, thanks for that education, D-W. It landed at Karam Shar, Iran, on the 6th of September. In 1994, the cargo of $26 million. That's a lot of money, my friends. $26 million. And I wonder if that's in 1994 money, because it would be worth more now. One of you, do the math. Somebody do the math. Give me a price point on 2,000 tons. Let's do metric tons of silver at today's silver prices. So please... One of you in the chat, throw down that number. Mrs. Malpe will read it to me. I know you can do the math. 2,000 tons. 
how many uh, troy ounces are in a metric ton, and then uh, do the math on that for today's silver quote. So in 1994, it looks like it was valued at $26 million, and that was 1,800. They only brought up 1,800 tons of the silver bullion and 3 million of the silver coins. So I'm thinking they must have had some large silver bars on there as well. Hmm. Here's a map. So it looks like that's where, okay, that's where it went down. It's out there off the Arabian Peninsula. That's the location of the John Barry. Interesting. Okay, so that's the attack there. That's the ship. You guys can see the ship. I even put it as a thumbnail for the channel. And uh, there's some more. There's some more info. We're not done yet. Um, so here's another piece. This is the 1944 silver Saudi real coins. And this is an article that says the Museum of Islamic Art yesterday announced that it has received a collection of 1,000 silver Saudi one real coins from Saudi businessman Bassam o Omar Salama. The collection was among 3 million of Saudi one real coins minted in the United States in 1944 during World War II at the request by then King, Saudi King, Abdul Aziz bin Abdurrahman Al Saud. That's a long name. It took up an entire line of that paragraph. Abdul Aziz bin Abdurrahman Aman Al Saud. In a letter he sent to the museum on the occasion, Salama said he received these 3,000 silver Saudi one real coins and was gifting a thousand of them to the Museum of Islamic Art in recognition of its role in preserving rare Islamic collections. Now, the history of this rare treasure, Bassam said, a cargo of three million silver Saudi one real coins was shipped to the port Raz Tanora in Saudi Arabia's eastern region during World War II, but the ship that was transporting them, the SS John Barry, never arrived. It was torpedoed by a German U-boat in the Arabian Sea, Let's see here. Pausing for a second. Carlos says the number. 45. Is that 45 million? 654,210 dollars? Wow. 45 million. 45.6 million. So it's gone up significantly, the value of this silver um, that they got from this wreck. A lot of silver, guys. This is a lot of wealth. I mean, think of how much. That's a lot of silver to find forty-five to find forty-five point six million dollars worth of silver today. It would be pretty astounding. Let's continue on. He added that in November ninety-four. Uh, where was I at? Oh, I'm at the part where they were torpedoed. Torpedoed by a German U-boat in the Arabian Sea, more than one hundred and eighty-five kilometers off the off of Oman, in August of forty-four, the ship broke in two and sank. She sank in waters that were so deep, no one thought she could ever be salvaged. Think of that, into the black depths of Davy Jones's locker. Oh, they challenge our technology, though. The, the treasure remained underwater until 1994, when a team of Bassam's friends financed an operation to recover the treasure. See, I wish I need friends like that. A group of friends that could be like, let us go and recover this treasure. And just like you get your friends together and you fund it. And lo and behold, after that, you have $45 million worth of silver. I wonder how much it cost them to do the operation. So they financed an operation. They recovered the treasure with the aid of the U.S. government, which provided them with information about the ship and the cargo. Of course, because they're our Saudi buddies. You know, we, they, we help each other out. Everyone had an interest in this, I'm sure. When there's $45.6 million on the line, back then it was $26 million, you know, people move. People make decisions. You know, stuff like this gets signed quickly. With the approval of Sultan Qaboos bin Said of Oman, they established the Blue Water Company to recover the treasure, the Saudi businessmen said. Bassam added that in November of 94, using satellite and state-of-the-art technology in the field of diving, the team recovered 1.4 million rials from the total of 3 million rials in an operation described by international media as the, it says here, as the strangest, biggest, and deepest recovery operation in history. And this comes from the Wikipedia entry on the SS John Barry. The SS John Barry, and we already covered all that. That's all the details, the info from what we already, already know. Further information can be found in the 1995 book, Stalin's Silver, by John Besant, published by Bloomsbury. Wow. 
This is, and this is another part that's interesting. Let me get to this part. The coins that were minted in Philadelphia. So, you know, the United States, these are U.S. Philadelphia mint, struck these silver reals. Now, they were minted at Saudi Arabia's request. At, at the cargo of 3 million silver Saudi one real. And you're, you're probably wondering why we're shipping this. We're going to get to it. We're getting to why. And you're going to love it because it's, <laughs> it just shows you how brilliant the Saudis typically are when it comes to, to money and what is money. Even to this day. To this day. The, so the cargo of 3 million Saudi, silver Saudi, one real coins were shipped to the port of Dharan in Saudi Arabia's eastern province late in World War II. Uh, the Liberty ship John Barry never arrived, torpedoed by a U-boat. Um, they thought so deep they never thought they could reach it. Workers building the new refinery had to be paid. Okay, this is the, the, the part about the refinery I want to get to. Paper money was not yet in use in Saudi Arabia. Okay, these people now, let's back up for a second. Even to this day, the Saudis, many people in the Arab region value gold and silver. They recognize it's been money for 7,000 years. And typically, they don't want to sell you their oil unless you're going to give them gold or silver. And there was a company called the Arabian American Oil Company, Aramco. It's one of the largest, wealthiest private companies in the world. It's not publicly traded. Uh, if my knowledge serves me right because I actually knew a guy that worked for Aramco and retired from Aramco, this gentleman. And we ended up, he was surprised I knew about the company. Very wealthy company. Um, again, they're not publicly traded, so all their profits stay there like in-house. And I mean, I want to say it's, it's like a multi-trillion dollar company when it comes to the amount of oil and resources they produce. Well, being that they are mostly Arab run and they have an affinity for precious metals, they want it to be paid and their workers want it to be paid in precious metals. So in order to, to keep refineries going and to get oil and to get things going over there, we had to ship them silver. They wanted to be paid in silver reals. So workers building the new refinery had to be paid. Paper money was not yet in use in Saudi Arabia. And by 43, the kingdom and Aramco had run short on real coins, the world economy was once so unsettled that the reals in circulation were valued more for their silver content than as a medium of exchange. Does that make sense? Think of that. I gotta pause. Miss Malpy's distracting me with her laughs. Sorry. What are you laughing at? What's going on? <laughs> what are you laughing about? It's the, just a, I'm sorry. I'm looking at memes. On this okay, side. you can't do that. You're distracting <laughs> me. I'll have to ask you to leave the classroom if you're not, if you're gonna be disruptive. <laughs> No, you can stick around. But just look, she's looking at cat memes, and I thought it was something in the chat. Goodness. Uh, Justin Welch, I don't think Aramco has IPO'd. No. I think I would have heard about it. I'm pretty sure they don't. And if they did, it was just probably part of their company. Hello, Bill Spencer. Hello, Mr. Ulfang, D-Dub, Carlos, all of you in the chat. We're going to continue on. This is a great story. It's like a lesson in sound money. Again, um, Saudis, they don't like paper. World's unstable. There's a great war going on. So silver is more valuable. They need silver. That's what they want. Um, it sounds like people were hoarding the silver that they did have and not circulating it as much because they were valuing it. Les Snyder, who was an Aramco employee in Dharan in 1944, recalled that the company had to scrounge for local supplies of reals, even sending him to Riyadh to buy coins from merchants there. The currency shortage was finally resolved when the Saudi government, under the terms of the 1941 Lend-Lease Act, arranged to buy silver in the United States to be minted into reals in Philadelphia. The first American minted coins arrived in Saudi Arabia in the autumn of 1943, marking the beginning of a new relationship between Washington and Riyadh. And by the end of the war, a total of 49 million reals had been shipped unscathed from the United States to Saudi Arabia. The only consignment that was lost was the DSS John Barry and the 2,000 tons of silver that this ship we're talking about tonight carried. Hudson says that the building uh, says that building the recovery equipment and raising the coins from such unprecedented depths was a victory in itself. It was a great relief that we found the reals. It gave us all a buzz, he says. 
It was rewarding to see such an effort prove itself. Financial rewards were harder to come by, however. Almost exactly a year after the recovery, on a rainy November night in Geneva, the coins were put up for auction by Sotheby's as a single lot. In spite of heavy advance publicity, they failed to attract a bid at a starting price of about $8 million. What? Wait a minute. Back up. Pause. Rewind it. In spite of heavy advance publicity, they failed to attract a bid at a starting price of about $8 million. But how, I thought it was... Hmm. I'm thinking... if I thought it was $24 million in silver. People were dumb. This is crazy. Coin reference books list the value of the uncirculated 44 reals as about $12 each. So the entire hoard, if each coin could be restored to mint condition, might be valued at $15.6 million. Sotheby's representatives in pre-auction interviews described the coins as representing a unique slice of history, more valuable than just the coins themselves. Interesting. So apparently, they obviously, they sold at some point. So it's one of the deepest wrecks ever found. I think you guys have all the information on it so far. We've, we've covered quite a bit. The ship, the sinking. Uh, here is another image of a coin. Let's bring it up real quick. Uh, that's not too good. Oh, you guys can see it. It's in the center of the screen. Silver Real. I think Mrs. Malpy should buy me one of these. If anyone in the chat thinks that Mrs. Malpy should buy me an, a, uh, an SS John Barry coin, they're not that bad. I mean, we're going to get to them in a minute. They're, they're quite affordable. But the history, that's the thing. Remember I told you guys about coins. These coins went through a torpedo. They went through a torpedo striking. What happened to Rolf's wrench? What happened to Rolf's wrench? What do you mean? Oh, it should be there. Oh, he'll, he has to approve it. Oh. So anyways, Rolf, if you can, I see you're in the chat. You're going to want to watch this from the beginning, my friend, because this involves some pretty cool stuff. This is some World War II. This is the SS John Barry. So we were just talking about this coin, and this coin here survived the sinking from a German U-boat. And I'm, I'm just going to continue on through the multiple articles that I found about this. And we'll have some sonar pings in the background, because I think it adds to it. Uh, let's go right here. The SS John Barry, bottomed the Arabian Sea. With millions of silver reals, rumors quickly arose that the ship had not only been loaded with 3,000 silver reals for Ramco, but also with tons of silver bullion destined for the USSR via India. See, that makes sense. Now, again, remember there was a reference to a book, Stalin's Silver. I, and remember, the German military at the time was brilliant. Uh, I happened to know many veterans who fought in World War II. One of them was actually on a U-boat. His name was Ernst. And he was captured uh, and had a lot of ticks. But I was fortunate as a young boy to know some former German soldiers that had sought uh, to live in the United States after the war. But uh, it's very likely, and I haven't read, again, I'd like to almost read this book and get more info on it. They probably knew, the Germans, that this, this ship had Stalin's silver on it. And of course, they didn't want Stalin to get anything. Arms, uh, I mean, obviously silver adds economic clout. And that's why the ship is so historical to me. When I first came upon it, I knew I was going to have to do a story on the SS John Barry here on the channel. Because again, it was, there's a lot of different facets to this story. Not only the sound money portion, okay, you have the Arabian oil world and the Arabs saying, look, we want to be paid in silver. Our people want to be paid in silver. Paper money's trash. People are hoarding their silver and not even circulating it because there's a shortage of it. And uh, so then you have these silver reals minted in America shipped over there to keep the oil going so that we can have oil for the war. And then also, apparently, there's these large bullion bars of silver also stowed on the ship that were supposedly destined for Stalin, which was obviously locked in a war on the Eastern Front fighting the Germans. All right. So a lot of history on why this ship was sunk, what it was carrying. Ah, it's incredible. Um, let's see here. The John Barry Group successfully located the Barry 94, used a grap to bring up 1.3 million, or um, let's see, it says silver reals, or 17 tons, before they ceased operations. Although no sign of the Soviet silver shipment was found, some experts still believe 
that there's a high likelihood the Soviet silver is aboard the vessel and was not located due to the primitive technology employed by the John Barry Group. Now here's the book Stalin's Silver by John Besant presents a well-written account of both the recovery and the rationale for why more silver may be located aboard the Barry. Sadly, due to the bureaucratic intransigence, the U.S. government has not reopened the vessel to a recovery bid process. Of course, you know what? I think it's because I think it's sensitive information. I don't think, you know what I'm saying? I think it's almost like top secret stuff. I, I think they don't want the public or people even, uh, any, anyone knowing that perhaps we were shipping silver to Stalin. That could be a reason. Until then, neither will the mystery be solved nor the American taxpayer be enriched by the recovery fees paid by the U.S. government, uh, paid to the U.S. government by a successful successful salver. So here's the deal. I need you guys to work on building me a submarine uh, in the chat. We'll get on that. It's going to have to go to a depth of about 8,500 feet um, so that we can recover the remaining silver bars off of this ship. So here's the silver ship. Again, um, we talked about, I think, most of this information we got to. But there's a lot of articles on it. Um, let's hear. This is a good one. We were. I'm going to try to read you some more here. This is another article written by Arthur Clark. And we might review a couple of extra pieces of material. But minted in Philadelphia at Saudi Arabia's request. Again, a cargo of 3 million silver Saudi one real coins were shipped to the oil port of Dharan in Saudi Arabia's eastern province in late World War II. The Liberty ship was transporting them as the SS John Barry never arrived. Torpedoed by German U-boat in the Arabian Sea more than 185 kilometers or 100 nautical miles off of Oman, August of 44. John Barry sank waters so deep no one thought she could ever be reached. Now, among the debris that marked her grave swirled rumors that in addition to the coins, she was carrying a huge cargo of silver bullion. Gerald Richards, now in his mid-70s, vividly recalls the night the John Barry sank. He was a merchant marine purser aboard the U.S. cargo ship. We were two days and eight hours out from Aden, he says. I was just getting around to going to bed, 9.55 p.m., when the first torpedo hit. It rocked us, I'll say that. Richards was thrown into oil-covered wreckage, strewn seas, when one of the Davits, Davits holding his lifeboat snapped before the boat could be lowered. After an endless 15 minutes in the water, he was picked up by another lifeboat. Later that night, he and his shipmates watched as another torpedo slammed into the John Barry, breaking her in two and sinking her into 2,600 meters, or 8,500 feet of water. One of the few remaining survivors of the Liberty ship's last voyage, Richards, knew there was something special about the John Barry's cargo. When he saw guards with machine guns on board as the ship loaded in Philadelphia in July of 1944, that kind of security was very, very unusual, he recalls. Amid a torrent of cargo, that included refinery equipment, lengths of pipe, military trucks, and a Caterpillar tractor. Richards didn't see 750 wooden boxes go into the heavily guarded number two hold. Stenciled on each box was the word Daran, the name of a new Middle East oil outpost. Secrecy was the watchword in more time, and the John Barry's crew should have known nothing about her secret cargo. But, says Richards, I always figured there was silver bullion aboard because of the security they put on until we sailed. After the war, he says he forgot about the matter until 1994 when he was shown a 50-year-old letter from the superintendent of the United States Mint in Philadelphia stating that three million silver coins had actually been on board. The John Barry crossed the Atlantic in a convoy, and proceeded south through the Suez Canal to Aden. Then, mysteriously, she was ordered to sail through the Arabian Sea alone on a zigzag course and in radio silence. Isn't that weird? That's the kind of weird stuff that you get, the information. It's like, why? When a German submarine picked up her trail, the John Barry didn't stand a chance. Astonishingly, only two crewmen were lost in the sinking. The next day, ships picked up the survivors and ferried them to shore. 
According to published accounts of the sinking, both Richards and the Barry's captain, Joseph Ellerwald, stated that the ship had been carrying $26 million worth of silver bullion. Since silver was then worth 48 cents per troy ounce, that reckoning, never corroborated by the U.S. government, would mean that the vessel's cargo had included more than 1,688 metric tons, or 1,857 U.S. tons of silver. I've asked myself how I knew. Everything was confidential then, says Richards, who now lives in Independence, Missouri. Up till I saw the letter from the Mint, I just figured there was silver bullion. Richards might have also asked himself why the silver, whether bullion or coins, was headed for Daran. And again, it's because what we talked about earlier, um, being that oil was the lifeblood of the war effort, they needed oil companies to be building, to going. And he says here, the small town on Saudi Arabia's east coast was the regional headquarters of what was then the Arabian American Oil Company, also known as Ramco. Now that uh, the Saudi Arabian Oil Company, Aramco, it was the site of a U.S. consulate. Oil had been discovered there just six weeks before. Just six weeks before they found oil there. Think of that. And Duran's population was only a few hundred men. But it was becoming clear that there was considerable oil deposits under Saudi Arabia's soil. Certainly, in the commercially interesting quantities, and oil was the lifeblood of the war effort. So it makes sense that, again, this is a lengthy article, talks a lot bit more about Germany and Russia and um, the deal of getting this, this uh, silver to the surface. But this is actually from Aramco's website, Aramco World, which is uh, interesting because this is, again, their website. So it's kind of like their company's history. And if you want, the link for it is archive.aramcoworld.com forward slash issue forward slash 199702 forward slash the dot silver dot ship dot htm. And I'll put a link to these stories in the description of this video so that you can read through all of them because it's pretty interesting. And then, of course, there's the generic um, short brief article from the, the Wikipedia on the SS John Barry. But again, you can have one of these pieces of history, which was actually, that's the coolest part about coins and stuff. You know, when I first discovered this wreck and became aware of it, of course, naturally, the first thing I did was search for a coin. I wanted to see if I could find one of these. And honestly, these are the only ones I've been able to find are right here. Uh, and they're on eBay. And it looks like it comes with a pretty cool little card let's see if i can blow that up yeah there you go so it comes with a certificate of authenticity guarantees the authenticity of the saudi arabian silver real the coin was recovered from the uh the john barry there's a little image of the coin i mean that's the coin itself it's in a slip this is like a it looks like a cardboard thing and then there's a plastic slip there and then it's got a picture of the ship the companies that brought it up looks like there's the other side of it there's a more closely detailed picture. They look like they're in remarkable condition. Again, they didn't circulate. They uh, were loaded onto a ship and then sunk by a German U-boat. There's an image of the technology used to bring it up. So, And this is apparently included with the, the coins. So that's kind of cool. Interesting. Comes with a little piece of material on the uh, recovery efforts. And then, of course, the history here is the, the story. Let's actually read it real quick because it says something here about the U-boat captain. It says, Jebson, now sure of his fourth kill as a submarine commander, lowered the periscope and set a course eastward. Three days later, U-859 sank the British ship Trulis. But within three weeks, within three weeks, she herself was sunk by the HMS Trenchant near Penang, Malaysia. Wow. So the sub that sunk this ended up getting sunk herself and it looks like down below there's an image of the ship uh, what was in the holds it looks like they had some tanks on there as well hmm and there's still a mystery to where if there's more silver on this ship down there so I think that's pretty cool anyway I wanted to share this with you guys on the channel because it's I mean it really is it's one of those stories that you can't beat.
It's got everything. It's got the desire for sound money, wartime paper currency problems, people hoarding silver, a treasure, sunken tonnage of silver. It's got U-boats, a recovery of that silver, some mystery of bars of silver going to Stalin, a book called Stalin Silver written about this story. So uh, I'd be interested to know how many of you had heard of this before and knew of the SS John Barry before I had. I mean, it, I just learned of this essentially last week and have been reading about it since then and thought, hey, let's share this with the channel because it's that great. And of course, I know a few of you. I'd be surprised if DW hasn't already snatched up one of these. I know one of you has probably already gone on eBay and bought one of these. But uh, they have buy it nows on there. You can make the guy an offer. I think I made an offer the other day and it was for like, I'm almost embarrassed. It was like 19 bucks and it was declined. <laughs> I was like... He certainly didn't make him an offer. They could refuse. <laughs> well, he doesn't, yeah. What was your Bronklin thing? I know. I tried. I made him multiple offers. But I just tried to... I figured, hey, it's not that much silver. There's a lot of them. Let's see what I can get it for. He refused my offer. Would you buy me one? Ma'am, please, ma'am. I'm gonna be honest with you. I have to go back and listen to this because I was looking at cat memes. You're gonna listen to my this. It's an interesting it. story. I was on the computer for eight and a half hours today. You were doing work. This is a cool story. <laughs> of course, I've got I hope it entertained all of you. It's a uh, it's a good story. I think I think uh, we all need one of these little historical coins. I'm surprised Rolf doesn't own one of these. He's the kind of guy. When his people, his little U-boat captains. What do you mean his people? His people. <laughs> I'm telling you, the, the U-boat captain was probably <laughs> awesome. I told them I was going to give a, a, a movie recommendation with this, and I'm going to. Have any of you ever seen the movie Das Boot, the German film? It's the best submarine movie ever made. It's about a World War II sub. Uh, I would recommend watching it in the German with the subtitles. It is a beautiful film. It truly is. It's the best submarine movie ever put on film. Probably the, the most accurate. And uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal piece. I, I wish you guys could, could watch it. Let me go read some comments from you guys real quick. Um, all right. Well, now you know, Rolf. Rolf says he's heard of the name of the ship and, and that it was sunk, but not the details of the silver she was carrying. Well, now you know. She was carrying silver to help the uh, get the oil going on the Arab Peninsula to help the war effort and also secretly it sounds like possibly smuggling some silver to Stalin as well all right well my friends I'm gonna read a couple more comments and then we're gonna shut it down so Let's earlier see. Carlos Danger had said so the U.S. pulled the old, lost my silver in a boating accident on Stalin. <laughs> <Yeah>. Crafty. <laughs> That's a pretty that was, clever, funny comment. <laughs> yeah, the, the U.S. pulled the, oh, we lost our silver in a boating accident. The Arabs are wondering, too, where theirs was. <laughs> They're like, where is deep silver you owe us for the oil? We give you oil, you give us no silver. And the U.S. is like, oh, yeah, about that. We lost our silver in a boating accident. <laughs> That's what you could say. Hey, my silver got sunk by a U-boat. All right. Well, it was a lot of silver. It was incredible. If you guys get a chance, again, watch. You know, we're gonna watch. It. Have you ever seen that movie, Mrs. Malpy? Have yes. you ever Das Boot? Yeah. No, the real one. You promise? Yes. This is not like your Star Wars crap. I have actually seen that movie. It's a cultured film. Yeah. The one in Germany. That's actually the cultured. old one. Okay. You've yes. seen it. Yes. We're watching it again, though. It's a good movie. Watch that any day over some of the recommendations. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What's the movie we watched the other night that was pretty good? We should tell them that was a good movie. Um, the Professor and the Madman. Oh, yeah. About the Oxford English Yeah, I'm like the Madman. Dictionary. Yeah, about the Oxford English Dictionary. That's a good movie. If any of you guys get a chance, The Professor and the Madman with Mel Gibson and Sean Penn. It was a good film. We watched it just the other night together. Oh, Jeff Keller is asking... That uh, he's saying he wasn't stacking when the Malpy rounds were first put out. Any info on any new rounds? At this time, not the rounds. 
I want to make a round for myself, but that is not going to be a very popular coin. Mrs. So Malpy's working on she's that. working on hers, but there are none available. You'd have to find them from people that have them in the chat. Uh, there was just a just under a thousand of them ever minted, and so at this point they're pretty scarce. I have the dies for them. Here's an idea. Here I'm going to share them with this. This is actually something I thought of recently, and it's because of one of the benefactors and friends, dear friends of this channel. You know, as we move through the ancient coinage and discuss ancient coins, I became interested in, of course, the ancient striking methods of coins, how they were made. And I looked up and was doing some reading and I watched some videos on that. And there's people that hand punch coins to this day. You know, you get the obverse and reverse dies and they hammer out and they'll punch coins. I thought, how cool would it be if I started getting like little blank quarter ounce blankets oh, of silver? That's not and hand no. no with my own dies no i can just imagine like i'd be in the house and i'd hear no you'd hear one yeah, big no, no, clink no. it'd be no. in the garage no i might do it you Drive can't you're not no it would only be a couple coins no one's gonna buy them i mean how many people in the chat are actually gonna buy a junior small but hand struck classical quarter ounce silver piece it would be pretty <laughs> difficult plus i have to get dies made i would have to find out uh. I want to have it look almost like those classical Roman coins. Look, this is my goal. And hand strike them and then let people stack like little this is ancient my goal quarter ounce. 2021 pieces. to make my headless bust coin. All right. Well, I'm going to make I a don't Junius care Denarius. If only one person buys it. I want to make it. Well, I'm going to make a Junius Denarius. Oh, Kennedy Allen says he'd buy my round. Kennedy Allen. That's one person at least. Yep, he would. I'm sure everyone will. Um, everyone in this chat would likely. Yes. Uh, all right. I'm going to make it. My headless bust coin. All right. We'll make your headless bust coin. You got a lot of people. I think your coins will sell. You'll do good. For I mean, obviously, you're not going to make a lot on that. You don't want to. That's the whole point is just getting your image, the, the idea out there. That's my whole point was when I did it. Was well, just, I just think it's very anti-history and it's very anti-Elizabeth. Yeah. Well, it just depends on your design. We need artistic renderings. You're going to need to... The process of having a coin minted is 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 multi-folded. You need first you need the, the renderings, you need to have dyes made, you need an artist that makes a sculpt, um, and then you have to have a place that's willing to mint them and distribute them. Like Atmex is that's the route I would take, or the uh, the other mint that you've been you could discuss it with them. You have to write a proposition. Oh yeah. Um, well, it was it wasn't you know thanks to the people on this channel I had. A lot of them helped me um, get the dies made and the coin struck. And that's that's how that worked out back then. It's different now because the quality silver bullion, the mint that put that coin out, was absorbed by another large coinage minting company anyways. I forget the name even. And they stopped doing like personal minting like that. Well, I'll... I'll uh... I'll have to figure out the uh, financing of the coin, but I'll make one. I'll make one. Yeah. I want to find, I need to find a way to get little classical dies made so that I can hand strike my own denarius coins. They will be a quarter of an ounce each of silver <laughs> and they will be hand struck, but they have to be like really cool, like Roman, you know, maybe, maybe me on one side with the yeah, lion's head, like the Alexander original. the Great. Yeah. Like I'm conquering the world. Conquering Persia. No. And then I could put you on the back, like the goddess Nike. Oh, you could be holding a point. torch. You could be holding <laughs> a torch and have a kitty at your point. feet. I'm doing it. I'm going to design it. it. I'm going to design a coin. It's going to be <laughs> ancient, though. It'll be me on the obverse, Mrs. Malpy, the goddess on the reverse, clutching like a torch and a little kitty at her feet or something. <laughs> yeah, I'll put a kitty on it for you. Or a couple kitties. We'll figure it out. Alrighty, that's it. We're going off the rails now. It's getting late, and I gotta go to bed because I gotta go to work. And uh, yes, DW mentioned that um, others like himself donated to help those coins happen, and absolutely, of that was super appreciated. Yep. In yep. fact, the only reason why those coins were made were because of no, people absolutely. Like you and, guys. and the thing is, that's it. It's the those are the veterans of this channel, guys like DW, that uh, literally made. The, the coin a reality. I mean, he, he, very influential. Absolutely. Um, it was, again, like, like I've always said, 
it was the impact and all the credit goes to the subscribers and the, the people of this channel that made that happen, that contributed and, and really made, I mean, cause it, yeah, you guys remember it was a, it was a lengthy process. I mean, it took months and months of communications, fundraising, um, feedback. We voted on, we even had all the different renderings to figure out how we were going to get the, the coin to look. And then, uh, we were fortunate to have a very, very renowned engraver come up with the obverse sculpt. And there you had it. We had that coin minted, you know, and I've got the dies still. I wish there was a way to change them a little bit and uh, have even have them struck again in some fashion or another, but have them struck uh, different because um, we, you know, we already have the dies, so. We'll you look. already got yours. I really want to make my headless bust. Yep, you gotta I'm get still it. Deciding work on it. Whether the decapitated head will be on the other side. I'm trying to remain true to history. D Dub's got ten of them. Good man, hold on to them. There's there uh, there are not not very many of those out there, my friend. Not very many, friend. We won't be offended if you melt them down. Yes, yeah, Sal was a huge help. Sal actually helped hook me up with uh, who he had strike his first coins. As well as uh, he he did a lot of the computer imagery that helped oh. bring the graphics together and lay out kind of like the if, architecture, if you want to call it, of what the coin would look like. So that was a fun. The same Sal who has kitty coins that yep. you won't yep. let me Yep, little kitty coins. Sal's got cats on all his coins. Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen, for tonight's story. The, the John Barry. Hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you for taking part in tonight's discussion on this. It was fun. It was a good time. A good read. Hopefully we all learned something. I will be in tomorrow with my own coin review. Yeah, Mrs. Moppy will likely be putting out a, um, a video tomorrow on her own coin. So we'll see how that goes. All right. Everyone, good night.